This is the, the Passion Week. This is the week that we obviously uh, move from Palm Sunday to Good Friday, coming up in just a couple of days, uh, and then Resurrection Day, when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus uh, this coming Sunday morning. And I know much has already been stated by Pastor Larry with regards to our, our, our flow of things this weekend with our kids and family time on Saturday at 1, our prayer meeting before Easter on Saturday night. But I wanted to take a little bit of time and talk to us about specifically Good Friday and what happened on that cross. Because really, some people have said it like this, the cross of Calvary was the axis of all humanity. The cross of Calvary was the thing upon which the world is framed. Now, whether or not society believes that, that is our hope. Calvary is our hope. We are here tonight because of Calvary. And we exist and we have joy and we have peace and anointing in our life because of the old rugged cross. And I'm thankful for that. Uh, Jim Bishop, back in 1957, wrote a book called The Day Christ Died. And I remember this because this book was in my parents' library for years. They may still have that book at their house. And I remember uh, walking by many, many times past the bookshelf and seeing this book. And as I was preparing for this lesson tonight, that flashed through my mind, that book, The Day Christ Died by uh, Jim Bishop. It, it's really a bestseller, and it was a book that, that chronicles that last 24 hours of Jesus' life. And what happened, all of the surroundings, the context of all of that. A man by the name of Dr. C. Truman Davis, uh, who was an active figure, by the way, just as a point of information, in the Christian school movement uh, many years ago, uh, wrote a whole treatise on the physical aspect of Jesus' crucifixion. What happened to him on the cross? Um, he recounts how after being flogged with the cat of nine tails uh, at, at the whipping post, which is accounted for in Scripture, Jesus was forced to carry the cross, that upper beam of the cross, which many people and historians believe could be up to 300 pounds that Jesus was forced to carry. And when he was carrying that cross, as they have diagrammed this out on the Via Dolorosa or the Way of Suffering, they have found out and estimated that the, the period of distance or the, the amount of distance that Jesus would have to carry that cross was over 650 yards. That's over six football fields that he is carrying in a weakened state after flogging this uh, large bar weighing upwards of 300 pounds or more. And so you can see right there, before really going any further medically in what happened to Jesus at the crucifixion, why he fell and why it was that Simon Cyrene was the one called to put the cross on his back and to walk it the rest of the way. According to Mark's account of the crucifixion, the Gospel of Mark, Jesus was on the cross for six hours. From the time he was originally crucified, Mark says it was the third hour of the day. Now, if you understand the Hebrew clock began at 6 a.m. and went to 6 p.m. And then during the overnight hours, 6 to 9, 9 to 12, 12 to 3, and 3 to 6, was called watches of the night. The first watch, the second watch, third watch, fourth watch. But during the, the daylight hours, if you will, they were simply identified by what hour it was. It was the third hour of the day. So he was crucified at 9 a.m. We also see that according to Mark's account, uh, after three hours, the sky was darkened. Darkness fell upon the earth, according to Mark. And this is found in Mark 15, verses uh, 25, and also verse 33. Now, some who have tried to uh, rationalize away Calvary and the crucifixion, that maybe Jesus really didn't die and there really wasn't darkness on the earth, have said that, well, that was a, that was a solar eclipse that happened to happen at that time. Well, the problem with that is, according to astronomers, an, a solar eclipse, the max of time that a solar eclipse can happen is seven and a half minutes. And according to Mark's gospel, uh, the sky was darkened for three hours. What we're going to examine a little bit tonight is the statements that Jesus made on the cross. He made seven statements while he was on the cross. And what we will also find is three of them happened when it was light outside, 
And more than likely, four of them, the last four, happened during the darkness, during the time of darkness before he died at what in our, our clock would be 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So take your Bible, please, and go with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 19. Gospel of John, chapter 19. And we will see the first reference to Jesus' words on the cross of Calvary. John 19 and verse number 26. Now, it's interesting also to note this. Many times a person's last words speak of what is truly important to them. Uh, Few are the people who in their last words on earth would talk about frivolous things but rather they would gather around them people close. That's just human nature. And their words would carry great weight. There perhaps are people in here right now, if you have lost loved ones over the years, and you remember some of their last words. They stay with us. They're many times important words. They're things, principles, or truths that we we live by the rest of our life. So uh, we're going to talk about these last words of Jesus. John 19 and verse number 26. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by. Now notice, before we show what he said, the Bible says in one verse earlier that standing by the cross of Jesus was his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So Jesus is on the cross. Here's what he said to his mother, verse 26. Woman, behold your son. Now, let me stop here and say this. On the surface, it would be easy to consider that it is her son hanging on the cross. He is speaking to his mother. And if we're, if we're quick and not studious about this, we could think, well, this is kind of Jesus saying, hey, check this out. But that's really not what he's saying. And the next verse tells us why. Verse 27. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. When Jesus uttered this statement from the cross, woman, behold your son, he was speaking to his earthly mother, Mary, but he was pointing out this progression of care that she would be given after he died on the cross. And the great thing about this, if we look at this from the standpoint of the Jewish culture, this actually falls perfectly in line with how the Word of God is set up. Because if you go back in the Old Testament, you will find example after example. If there is this person that dies, head of household, then this person becomes head of household of that household. There is this natural and intentional progression of care that is set up. So even on the cross... Even in a horribly weakened condition, Jesus is speaking and making sure his mother knows, Mom, you're going to be taken care of. I want you to behold your son. He is going to be in my place to care for you. And and certainly, if, if you look at Jesus Christ, and I want to say this, Jesus in a culture of that day that really did not lift up women and their rights, Jesus was a champion of women and their rights. And so this is part and parcel of his entire life. Woman, behold your son. And then he looked at the disciple whom we know to be John, because John actually never identifies himself in his own gospel. He says to the disciple, behold your mother. Jesus is teaching the principle of family and how important family connections and family wholeness is. That's remarkable to me that in that state, that was on his mind. He wanted to make sure my mom's taken care of. Hey, mom, you're going to be taken care of by this good man, the disciple whom the Lord loved. And John, you now have the responsibility of taking care of my mother. Everybody say family. Family. You know, it's in stressful times that we really see how close of a relationship that we've developed with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not in the good times. It's in the tough times. How many of you know tough times reveal our relationship with God? 
when things are stressful, when things are, are, are the, the waves are tossing our boat, so to speak, the wind is blowing, that really reveals the real us. And I pray that God will allow me, and I pray that God will allow you to be the kind of people that the, the harder it gets, the more we cling to the Lord. The more we cling to the Lord. Number two, this is in Luke chapter 23. We'll go to Luke chapter 23. And verse number 34. Luke 23 and verse 34. Then Jesus, we'll start at 33. When they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and they cast Lots. This is another amazing thing for me to witness in this passage. Because Jesus, in the midst of a heinous crime inflicted upon an innocent person, decided to forgive. Now I'm going to say that one more time and I want to say it with intention. Jesus, in the worst of his times, decided to forgive. Because you know what? I think it's safe to say, and I'm not one that's ever been crucified, but I think it's safe to say in that current state, he probably didn't feel like forgiving. He's hanging on a cross because of what they have done to him. But in that moment, he let us realize a powerful truth. Forgiveness is a choice, not a feeling. I intentionally release somebody from the penalty that's on their head. Forgiveness really is the centerpiece of the gospel. Where there is no forgiveness, there's bitterness, there's regret. And yet Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 says that Jesus despised the shame. He scorned the shame and stayed on the cross. So I have to ask myself this question with Jesus as the role model for forgiveness. Number one, do I allow people who have hurt me to permanently offend me? That's a question I've asked myself even today as I get, get ready to teach this tonight. Do I allow people who have hurt me to permanently offend me? Number two, Tim, Gaddy, am I able to see past people's disapproval of me? and see their, listen very closely, ignorant state of mind. Wrongdoing against other people most of the times is rooted in ignorance. They do not know what they're doing. Now listen, before everybody jumps in conclusion, say, oh baby, you don't know my husband. You don't know my wife. You don't know this situation. No, here's the thing. If people truly understood what sin does to a person and how it eternally separates them from God, if, if not repented for, they wouldn't do that. It's an ignorance thing. Sin is the most ignorant thing to do. Can I get a witness in here? Amen. Amen. Yes. Have you? Okay, let's just cut right to the chase. Have you ever done something? I'll be the first to raise my hand yes to this. That after you did it and you realize how foolish it was what you just did, you thought, I can't believe I just did that. You know what that was? That was ignorance. Not understanding what I was just doing to myself and what I was just doing to other people. And, and yet Jesus, understanding this, said, he chose to say, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Everybody say forgiveness. forgiveness. Look at somebody and say, say it. Say, let's, let's practice forgiveness. Mm, that's a good one. Skip down just a few verses if you would. Luke chapter 23 and verse 43. I'll give you the context. There's two thieves crucified on either side of Jesus. Criminals. Guilty. One of them begins to swear at the Lord and curse him. The other in that weakened state looks at Jesus and simply says this in verse 42 of Luke 23. Lord, remember me when you come into 
your kingdom. Verse 43, it's the third statement Jesus made on the cross. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus was extending hope and he was extending encouragement all the way to the end. It's powerful, these principles that he's teaching, these last words of Jesus. They deal with family. They deal with forgiveness. They deal with hope. They deal with encouragement. You notice he's not ever saying, woe is me. I got it so bad. You've heard me say this before. You, you know what it is to ask somebody, how you doing? And you instantly regret that, that question. Are my words full of hope and encouragement? Jesus, during his worst time, was reaching in mercy to someone who was reaching to him. That's mercy. That's mercy. I want to be that kind of merciful person. That's why Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall see God. Number four. Matthew 27, look at this in your, in your Bible, please. The fourth statement that Jesus uttered on the cross, last words. Matthew chapter 27, verse 45. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Now, if you ever want to do a fascinating study, look at the book of Psalms and all the Psalms that refer to Jesus Christ. If you're not opposed to writing in your Bible, right next to that verse, would you write down Psalm 22 and verse number 1? Because Jesus, in saying this utterance, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, or my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He is actually quoting the psalmist. This exact phrase is written in the book of Psalms, Psalm 22 and verse number 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus was 100% flesh and 100% God. His flesh was crying out. He didn't, listen, he didn't take his pain out on other people. His flesh was hurting. He was in a bad place. It was a horrific way to die. The Romans had, had learned all of this crucifixion thing from the Carthaginians, who they learned a whole lot of stuff from, many of which was not kind to humanity. And yet in this crucifixion, in this Roman horrible way to die, Jesus hurting did not take it out on other people. He was honest his flesh was crying out, but he was crying out in prayer. I'm thinking about the, the, the song of old that says this. Part of it says this. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. I want to get to the place, I need to get there, where when pain comes, I immediately go to the Lord. Amen. I don't far, foolishly charge God, but I say, Lord, help me right now. This is hurting me right now. You know what Jesus was doing? He was crying out honestly. His flesh was crying out. But he chose to channel that pain in prayer. That's a powerful, powerful thing taught to us right there. John 19 and verse 28. This is one of the shorter statements that Jesus made on the cross. John 19 and 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Boy, that's human. That shows frailty. But as I was reading through these verses and preparing this message tonight, I felt the Lord just hit the pause button right here at number five. 
And, and I want to say something that I just feel directed of the Holy Ghost tonight. Our weakness is never a reason for God not to use us. In fact, God delights in our weakness. Because he can be seen strong through our weakness. I want us to see this in the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Would you turn there? Just It's a few pages over from where we stopped. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This passage speaks to me because how human it is. Paul said this in the seventh verse of 2 Corinthians 12. Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Verse 8, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. You ever been there before? You prayed for something once and it didn't seem to go away. So you prayed again and it didn't seem to go away. And you prayed again and it didn't seem to go away. And we might want to stop right there and say, hey, Lord, are you listening to what I'm praying? Here's what verse 9 says. And he said to me, how many know God answers after the third time? And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Isn't it amazing how sometimes the answer that we want is not the answer that we get? But the answer that we get from the Lord when we beseech his throne and ask him for help is simply this. I'm going to give you my grace right now. I'm going to give you the thing that you need to get through this storm. You might be buffeted. You might be inflicted with pain. It might cost you some things. But I'm going to tell you this. All while you're going through that, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace, you're going to get a taste of what amazing grace really is. That's more than a song. That's more than a tune Christians sing. I'm going to give you grace, and it's going to be enough for you. It's going to be sufficient. It's amazing to me that the Lord, in answering him, did not say, okay, I'll take that thorn. But rather he said, okay, I'll give you grace. My grace is sufficient for you, Paul. And my strength is made perfect in weakness. Something I want to just point out to you in the New Testament when Paul, mainly it's Paul, that writes like this, uses the word perfect. There's a synonym, synonym rather, that we can use in place of the word perfect, and that is the word complete. So it does not stretch the scriptures at all for us to say that Paul heard this from God. My strength is made complete in your weakness. See, it's amazing to me. Many times I feel like my weakness cancels out the possibilities for God. When God says, if you'll just give me your weakness, I'll show you how complete my grace can be. If you'll just quit trying to be strong and just understand you're weak. Hey, do we all understand that tonight? There's none of us that woke up floating six inches off the bed this morning. I don't think there's any of us that our first words were in tongues this morning. <laughs> we're weak. We're fallible. We have failing ways, but when yielded into the hand of God, his strength can be made complete. And I'm just going to tell you that the people in my life that I have seen that I just think it's awesome what God is doing are not the people that are the strongest in who they are, but they're the people with limitations and things that they're incomplete in, and yet they lean on the Lord's strength. And they say, God, if this is going to come to pass, I'm going to have to have your help right here. Oh, I'm praying God will give us a revival of yielded weakness to the Lord. Lord, I give you who I am. I give you every failing part of me. Lord, I have to have your help. If the Lord's not on my side, I can't make it, folks. 
Come on, do I have anybody in this house that witnesses that? Without the Lord, we can't make it. We can't be strong enough. We can't be strong enough. Uh, don't, don't be afraid of your weakness. Amen. I didn't think we'd run aisles on that one. But I still think that's a powerful point that Jesus teaches us on the cross. Number six, Luke 23 and verse 46. The sixth statement. This is a statement made in the darkness during that second three hours that Jesus was on the cross. Luke 23 and verse number 46. Five, the sun was darkened, the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. See, Jesus saw that his life on earth was a clear mission from heaven. Jesus knew his assignment was ending. And right now, that flesh cries out and says, Father, I commit, I commit into your hands my spirit. I pray, and they're going to put this on the screen. I ask them to put this phrase on the screen. I pray that we would see that anything we go through when yielded to God is an opportunity for God to get glory. Whew. Time out. We need to read that together. Read it with me. Anything we go through when yielded to God is an opportunity for God to get glory. Any good thing that's yielded to God is an opportunity for God to get glory. Any tough thing that's yielded to God is an opportunity for God to get glory. Anything we go through, even when people do things to us, even when we didn't bring it on ourselves, someone else took advantage of us. Here, we still have a decision to make, brothers and sisters. What am I going to do with what has been handed to me? And anything, I want to read it again, anything we go through when yielded to God is an opportunity for God to get glory. I'm praying that every part of my life gives him glory. I pray that everything I go through gives him glory. I pray every response that I have gives him glory. I pray every word that I say, every decision that I make points people to Jesus Christ. Gives him glory. Let's read it one more time. Anything we go through when yielded to God is an opportunity for God to get glory. Jesus taught us the power of committing ourselves into the hands of God. Praise God. Look at one more passage besides the sayings with me before we finish, and I'm just about done. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And this passage right here speaks to why you and I are here tonight. Now, without making a big, big flashy statement, I do want to say this. I know what the will of God is for every one of us drawing breath in our bodies right now. And it's found in the Word of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. The purpose of every man and every woman in this room is to be an ambassador, a spokesperson, a representative for Jesus Christ to this world. So that everything we go through says to people, be reconciled to God. Come to know God. My life, my reactions, how I conduct myself, my, my motives, my agendas, my spirit. Everything we go through should point people to Jesus Christ. I want people to see the Lord in everything in my life. Finally, John chapter 19, the last statement. John 19 and verse number 30. It is the second shortest statement on the cross. 
Verse 29, a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there and they filled a sponge. By the way, that was the cheapest wine that they could find. They didn't even respect him with that. And they filled a sponge with sour wine and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth, a sponge-like uh, substance. Verse 30, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his, bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Now, here is where there's a big disconnect between how I have taught these sayings and how Jesus uttered them on the cross. And I just briefly told you about this doctor that did this uh, medical look at Jesus on the cross. More than likely, nearly every single statement of the seven that I have just read and that we've looked at tonight was uttered with gasps and very quick, terse statements. Jesus, I don't believe, melodically said any of these things. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He was dying. If you do any study of crucifixion, he was suffocating on that cross. His lungs were filling with fluid. It was a graphic and horrible way to die. But yet before he gave up the ghost, he uttered those three words. It is finished. Now, I've preached a little bit on this recently, so I'm not going to re-preach that. But in those three words, there was the culmination of a new covenant born for humanity. No longer was, it, was humanity bound by the legalism of the law. But now through three words, three words mentioned on that cross, you and I can stand and sit in this room tonight free. We can have hope. We can have joy. We can have peace. Why? Because of what he did on that cross. Because of the price that he paid, he knew that his mission was to go to that cross. I want to submit it to this great congregation. The purpose of Jesus Christ was not to heal blind eyes and open deaf ears. He did that, but his purpose was to go to that cross. And because he went to that cross, it, every requirement, it, the plan of God, it is finished. It's done. It's accomplished. It's over. Hallelujah. And what we see demonstrated on the cross, go ahead and stand with me. What we see demonstrated on the cross is a man with no regrets. Oh, I wrote this in my notes. I am trying to live my life so if the Lord should take me tonight, I could say I have no regrets. Forgive the way I, I say this. I don't mean this in, in, a, in a, a, any sort of way that's, that's flippant. But I want to leave it all on the field, brothers and sisters. I don't want to leave this world with regrets of things I didn't say, people I didn't forgive, people I didn't reach out to. I want to leave it all on the field. I want to be the kind of man that when life is over, I can say, it is finished. The assignment that I've been given, it is finished. Praise God. No regrets. So I want to say this as we're, we're getting ready to pray to finish, to finish this service. If there's someone you need to forgive, do it today. If there's something you need to release, do it now. If there's something you need to make right with somebody, do it now. Live a life like Jesus of no regrets that he could get to the end of his life and not have a little hiccup here or a little regret here, but say, you know what, my mission has been accomplished. The purpose for which I came has been accomplished. It is finished. Let's pray right now and just commit this into our spirit. Lord, thank you for teaching us tonight from your last words. So many things you taught. Family and forgiveness and hope and encouragement. You're teaching us, Lord, and you're challenging me tonight, Lord, to live a life of no regrets, giving you every part of my life, holding nothing in reserve, Lord. 
Oh, Jesus, I pray for the great people of this church. I pray the hand of God will be upon us, Lord. I pray that you'll help us to come this coming weekend, Lord, with a shout on our lips and a praise in our spirit, Lord, rejoicing that the grave is empty. Death has been spoiled and the penalty has been paid, oh God. I thank you, Lord. We give our lives to you, Jesus. Help us to practice forgiveness. Help us, Lord, to be a people that represent you well on this earth. And for that, we're going to give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Praise God. Aren't you thankful for the Lord Jesus tonight? Aren't you thankful for the price he paid for us? Amen. Thank God for his price. Amen. I hope you'll leave tonight encouraged in your spirit. And uh, be with us this weekend, 1 o'clock on Saturday for families, and then an all-church prayer meeting Saturday night, specifically designed for Easter Sunday. And then we'll see you. Bring, invite some people to be with you. I was on the phone today inviting people to come on Sunday, 9 and 11. God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of Jesus. Thank you for being here tonight.